So turn in your Bible to Genesis 15, if you will, please. And by the way, uh, those cupcakes, uh, we're, my wife and I are planning on delivering them to the other grads as well. We don't want them to go stale, and we don't want to end up eating them all. So we won't, uh, we're going to deliver them and the gifts uh, today. All right, Genesis chapter 15. You know, I've been having uh, computer problems. My desktop hard drive crashed, and so... I've had to call uh, the tech department to, of the manufacturer, and I'm telling you, I have put in my time on hold. I hate being on hold, do you? It just is so frustrating to me, it's like you're on hold forever. That's one of the greatest difficulties of my life is waiting. I remember when I was a kid doing something wrong and my dad not being home and my mom saying to me, you wait till your dad gets home. You're going to get it. I mean, that ruined the rest of my day. <laughs> it was on my head, on my conscience. I couldn't, uh, I wanted it to be over with, but it dragged on. On the other hand, I remember as a child when my parents would promise me something that I wanted very badly, and then I had a hard time waiting for that. To be fulfilled. What you have in Genesis 15 is really both of that. You have two kinds of waiting here, and that's why I am titling this message God's Waiting Room. Because you have Abram, first of all, waiting fearfully for a possible attack. Maybe he is going to suffer an attack because of the great victory that he just had. And then, in the other part of the chapter, you have him waiting for God, his heavenly Father, to make good in his promise of a seed, that is a son, and of land that God promised him. And so, I want to I approach it this way. I want to say that this is so typical of our lives. We are often found in a waiting, holding pattern, waiting on God. I don't know about you, but I'm always a step ahead of everything and everyone. And, and sometimes I feel God ought to be where I am. And I've realized over the years that God has done so many things to slow me down, to make me wait, to put me in his waiting room. And here there is... Abram waiting on God, and in doing so, verse 1, he's dealing with fear. And then in the rest of the chapter, he's waiting on God in the delaying of the fulfillment regarding the promise that God made to him. So I want to pause and have a word of prayer and then look at this as quickly as we can. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day and for the blessings that we've already enjoyed in song and, uh, and just in the, uh, the gifts that you have given. Thank you for these young people. Thank you for you and all that you are and all that you do. Thank you for the Bible, your word this morning. Would you cause your word to just hit its mark, to just speak to us as individuals? Lord, you know what each one of us needs to hear from you, and so would you Thus, speak accordingly. And Lord, give us ears to hear, and may we have hearts that would respond positively and say, yes, Lord, your will, not mine. I just ask that you would teach us now and that you would accomplish the thing that pleases you to the glory of Jesus. In his name we ask it. Amen. Look at verse 1, chapter 15. After these things, what things? Well, in chapter 14 that we looked at last week, there is a big battle. And at the end, Abram won the victory. He, with four, uh, five other kings, defeated four kings that had come to invade. And they had captured Abram's nephew Lot and his family and taken all the goods of the people in the city of Sodom. And Abram and these kings went after him. Abram was the, the commanding general, and uh, they, they enjoyed great victory. And they defeated their enemies. 
And they got everything back that had been taken. Have you ever been in the position where you have had something great happen and then you began to have second thoughts and perhaps feared what the repercussions might be as a result of what has been accomplished? I think that's what's happening here. It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. God knows your heart. God knows your head. God knows what's going on in your life. And he knew that Abram had fear in his heart from whatever he was thinking or dwelling upon. And so God speaks to him, and I see in this how God would have us to deal with fear. And fear is a natural God-given emotion. We all have it. It's, uh, it's something that uh, is, it, it just comes with being a human being. But what we have to learn is to be able to control our fear. It's not God's will for your or my fear to control us. We're to be in, in control of our fear. And so we need to learn how to not let fear control you. How not to let fear reign over you like a tyrant in your life. Now, one of the first things that I would say based upon Abram being fearful is there has to be an acknowledgement of that. I think it's a mistake to ignore, to deny, or to suppress any emotion, and uh, especially fear. We need to be honest and uh, assume personal responsibility for the fact, you know what, I'm, a, I'm afraid, I'm fearful. God created us, and in doing so, he created us, the Bible says, in his image. And so he created us with emotions like he has. Not that God's fearful, but God gave us emotions that includes fear. And so it's unwise for us to, though given emotion by God, to totally rely upon our feelings. You can't live by your feelings, because feelings are up and down, aren't they? Feelings come and go. Feelings are always in flux. They're always changing. So you can't live by your feelings even though they're God-given. You can't bypass your mind and let your feelings control you. But you, you have to have the ability to recognize your emotions and admit fear. And I believe that admitting it is the first step in conquering it and subduing it. I remember a couple of occasions in my life when, when I was gripped with fear. One in particular I'll never forget. I'm not going to go into it. But I've never had fear like that before. I really believe it was demonic. I'm convinced of it that because of the circumstances. Uh, I remember uh, being fearful when this uh, coronavirus first uh, broke out and we were locked down. And I'm thinking, what's going to happen to Bethel Baptist Fellowship? What's going to happen to the church? And, and immediately, you know, fear gripped me. I remember laying in bed that night, and I had a hard time going to sleep as a result of it. But I, I settled it with the Lord, and that fear hasn't, uh, hasn't returned. The fact of the matter is, the first step to conquering it and subduing it is to admit it, is to acknowledge it. There's got to be that acknowledgment. It's natural to feel vulnerable, uh, especially after you come through a dangerous thing like uh, Abram uh, and uh, his, his uh, fighting men had. It's uh, difficulties often breed fear. You remember Elijah? Great man of God, right? Great prayer warrior. A man that uh, prayed and God closed heaven and there was no rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and God opened the heavens, and it rained. And he, call, he called upon God, and God sent fire from heaven. And then after that, he's running like a, a scared rabbit, running into the wilderness, saying, God, kill me. I'd rather you take me than have Jezebel kill me. Fearful. Especially when you know that someone's out to get you. But what we forget about when we have fear, what we often forget about is 
what, what, what has God said to us? What has God promised us? What does he have for us in, in the word of God? And whenever I have feelings of fear like that, I want to go to God about it. I want him to speak to me. So dealing with fear, first of all, there's acknowledgement. And then when you have had that acknowledgement, then you need to turn to God for the encouragement. It's a mistake to deny or to ignore feelings of fear. But when you're fearful, you need to hear from God. And look at what happens in verse 1. Right at that moment, the word of the Lord came unto Abram. God spoke to this man at a very fearful time in his life. And when God speaks to you when you're fearful, I'm telling you, it'll conquer your fear. It'll change the whole picture for you. And God commands him. Notice this in verse 1. Abram, I know you're fearful. Stop it. Fear not. That's a command. Fear not. God's word of encouragement to you, first of all, is that you stop living in fear. And he repeats that same kind of command to all of the patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He repeats that uh, to Moses and Joshua and the people of Israel. And you can follow that same uh, command into the New Testament. And he says it to us, the New Covenant people of God. Stop fearing. Don't fear. Fear not. How many times uh, did uh, Jesus or an angel in the New Testament in the Gospels tell them, don't fear. Don't be afraid. And so the word of the Lord came to him. There's the encouragement. And it is a command from God. And really the cure is simply this. Fear not, Abram. I am. And we know, we know the weight of those two words. I am. He is the great I am. That is, he is the God that always was, is, and always will be. He is the eternal, self-existent one. He needs no one or no thing in order for him to exist. Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. There's the cure for fear. You want to deal with fear? Acknowledge it and take the encouragement of the Word of God, and that is what the Bible says who God is. And here, He is your shield. You know that, uh, you know the, um, the uh, Star of David? It's called a, a Morgan David, right? The shield of David, the Mogan shield of David. It was found uh, on a shield, and it was said to be uh, the, uh, the, uh, the emblem that was on the shield of David's men. Don't know if that's true or just tradition. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But God is your Mogan. God is your shield. That's what he says here. In other words, he is your protector. When he is present, he's your shield, your protector. And then he is, notice this, Abram, I'm your exceeding great reward. In other words, I'm not only your protection, but I am your provision. Remember all the spoils of war that Abram said, I don't want anything. I don't even want a string. Or a, or, or a sandal fall. Take it all. Maybe he had second thoughts afterwards. And God says, don't worry about it. I'm your exceeding great reward. There is no comparison with the provision that you have in me versus what you just gave up to the king of Sodom. And so really, the believing life is only as great as your faith. And your faith is only as great as what the object of it is. What your faith is in. 
For faith to be great, it has to be fixed on the Lord. Who He is. He is your shield. He is your exceeding great reward. And all possible loss and all possible danger, hey, God's got it covered for you. He's got you covered. He's your shield. He's got you covered. He's your exceeding great reward. He'll meet all your need. That's what the Bible says. Uh, God tells Moses and the people of Israel, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are everlasting arms. He's your shield. He's your protector. And then he says, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. God is going to meet your needs. He's going to be your reward. So, dealing with fear in verse 1. And then, delaying fulfillment in the rest of the chapter, really, dealing with the, he deals with fear by talking about God's presence with us. And now he, he confronts this waiting, this delay in the fulfilling by reminding him of God's promises. God's made some tremendous promises to this man, Abram. But they're still unfulfilled. Because God has him in a holding pattern. God's testing this man's faith. God's building him. It's not yet God's time for these promises yet to be fulfilled. But they will be in God's time. And so, this is important. Look at verse uh, 2 with me. Abram said, Lord God, what are you going to give me? Saying, I go childless. And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of, uh, of Damascus. You see, God promised, you remember in chapter 12, Abram, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to make of you a great nation. Well, if he's going to make a great nation of Abram, Abram at least has to have a start. It has to originate with a child a son through which that great nation could uh, come forth from. He doesn't have that, and he's an old man at this point. When God said, I'm going to make of you a great nation, God was saying, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a descendant and descendants. I'm going to give you an heir. I'm going to give you someone who will inherit the promises that I've given to you. And by the way, God has singled out Abram and his son, who will be called Isaac, and his descendants. God has singled out Abram and his descendants to be the fulfillment of that, that first promise that we looked at in Genesis 3.15. That there will be, from the seed of a woman of all people from the seed of a woman there will be one that will come forth who will crush the head of the serpent right remember that Genesis 3 15 the first promise of a redeemer and Abram is singled out to be the the channel the conduit through which uh, the, the 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 originator through which that would be uh, fulfilled and so Abram's wondering he's saying Lord how is this going to be? I don't even have a child, and I'm up in age, and so is my wife. And uh, so he comes up with a, 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 a possible, he's asking here in verses 2 and 3, and he comes up with a, with a possibility. He said in verse 3, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, you haven't given me a son. And, uh, but there is a, a servant that is born in my house, that is the most trustworthy servant that I have. And of course, it's probably uh, this Eliezer, right? Probably the same servant that he sent in chapter 24 to find a wife, when he did finally have a son, Isaac, to find a wife for Isaac. But anyway, God had made a gracious promise and had a glorious plan for Abram he said, I'm going to not only give you a seed, but your, your descendants are going to be so numerous, they're going to be like this, this, the, uh, the dust in the ground, they're going to be like the stars of the sky. You won't be able to count them, there will be so many of them. And here he doesn't even have one son at this point. 
And of course, Lot's out. He went back to Sodom. And time is running out. Abram and Sarah are, they're getting older by the year. And so the logical plan that Abram comes up with is, I'm, gonna, I'm going to adopt my chief of staff, this special servant of mine, and I'll make him my heir. He'll inherit, he'll be the one through which the seed will come. God will have none of that. Look at verses 4 and 5. He goes from asking to looking. The word of the Lord came unto him. Again, God speaks. Crucial point. This shall not be thine heir. No, your plan's no good. Your plan, scrap it. It's not going to work. This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall... In other words... You are going to produce a child. I don't care if, how old you are, how old your wife is. Verse 5, And he brought Abram forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, count them, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So God reiterates uh, the numerous descendants that he's going to have. God made it clear Abram, you're going to be the father of the future heir and not your servant. In fact, not only that, but I am, I am going to give you through that son that you haven't had yet, I'm going to give you so many descendants. He takes them outside and he gives them his viewpoint, God's viewpoint. God has him looking up. God says, look up. Look at the stars in heaven. Can you count them? If you can't count them, you won't be able to count the number of descendants that I am promising you. God not only gives him a son, promises him a son, but innumerable seed as well. Well, look at what uh, his response is regarding this inheritor, this heir. Verse 6, and he believed in the Lord, that is Abram, believed in the Lord, and he, that is God, counted it to him, Abram, for righteousness. Verse 6 of chapter 15 is probably one of the most important verses in the entire, what we would call the Old Testament. It's really all there. This is what salvation is. You know, some people have falsely believed that people in the Old Testament were saved by keeping the law of Moses. Nothing could be farther from the truth. People were always saved by the same method. And that method is that they believe God. They believe the promise of God. I want you to see that sixth verse. It's the first reference in the Bible to Abram's faith. It says, he believed in the Lord. First time we ever see that about Abram in the whole Bible, even though he's called the father of faith, right? And in Hebrew, that sixth verse is just five words. But there are three particular words in our English version that I want you to key in on with me for a moment in that sixth verse. It says, when God, showed, when God said what he did, when God spoke to him and showed him the stars and said, that's how many descendants I'm going to give you, and uh, your servant is not going to be the heir, but a son that will be produced by you and your wife will be the heir, it says that he, Abram, believed in the Lord. That's a key word, believe. Literally, he said, Amen. He said, Amen to God. He believed God. And the Bible, uh, by using that term, believed, means that Abram leaned all of his weight on what God told him, on what God promised him. You know, that's exactly what faith is, and that's the kind of faith that saves. Abram believed in the Lord. I remember talking to a Jewish uh, doctor uh, many years ago, and I was witnessing to him, and uh, I, I asked him what he thought was necessary to um, have the, 
to have a relationship with God and to 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 have eternal life and and he went back to keeping the law and I said well what about what the father of the Jews did what what meaning does this have it says that he believed in the Lord and God counted that to him for righteousness If you're saved today, if you are truly a born-again believer, it's because you have believed in the Lord. It's because you have leaned all the weight of your need on the Lord Himself, on what He has done for you. And you are not leaning any weight on anything that you can do, any law that you can keep, any uh, mitzvot or good deeds that you might be able to accomplish. He believed, simple as that. He believed, and as a result of that, God said, I am imputing righteousness to him. Notice the word righteousness there, because that's the greatest need of every human being, righteousness. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there is not a single person that in God's eyes is righteous. Not one. Not one. Not me, not you, not any human being. Not one. That's what the Bible says. And so that means that God totally rejects any self-righteousness that we might claim. And that really is the kind of righteousness that most human beings are counting on. If they care about righteousness at all, they're hoping to... Uh, to produce it themselves. In fact, that's the whole problem with Judaism. And that's the whole problem with the, with the, uh, the, uh, the Orthodox, is that they are going about by their own righteousness to gain the favor of God. And that's totally wrong. Abram believed in the Lord, and God counted that to him for righteousness. It wasn't something that he did. It was simply that he leaned his full weight of hope on God and, and believed God's word, and God gave him righteousness as a result of that. God rejects self-righteousness. He only accepts the righteousness which is of faith. Over and over again, you'll find that that former rabbi, uh, Saul of Tarsus, will say this, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And it is totally the opposite of self-righteousness that human beings think that they can, they can produce and earn. Third word in that sixth verse is the word counted. Believed, righteousness, and counted. The word counted literally means to put to one's account. To put to one's spiritual account. In other words... How can I have God's righteousness put to my spiritual bank account? How can I have God's righteousness counted to be mine in my life? One way. One way. Abram believed God, and God's righteousness was counted to Abram's spiritual bank account. By believing the Lord you are counted righteous. I would say that uh, this sixth verse is really spelled out in great detail and expounded on in Romans chapter 4 and Romans chapter 5. And there are some tremendous verses there, and Abram himself is even mentioned. And I, uh, I just may uh, reference two verses. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abram, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be as not as though they were. What's he saying? He's saying simply this. He's saying that every single person that is saved is a child of Abraham in a spiritual sense. He is the father of us all. How so? 
He is the Father of us all because the way that you are saved is the way Abram was saved. He believed in God and God counted that to his account as God's righteousness. You trust Jesus as your personal Savior and God counts that to you as his righteousness. He imputes it to you. That's what is being taught here. And then in verses 7 to 21, the attention is turned from the inheritor, the heir, to the inheritance, the land. Look at verse 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee the land to inherit it. And he, Abram, said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Here he is again. He is reaffirmed by God that God is going to give him this promised land. And as a result of that, Abram responds, and he says, turn this down, please, it's too loud. Well, Abram responds, and he says, what guarantee, what assurance do you give me of this land that you've promised me? He already had been given uh, assurance regarding the heir. Now what about uh, the inheritance? It's like this. God promised him, first of all, a seed and made him wait. And eventually that seed produced Jesus the Messiah. And then God promises him a land, but the people of Israel never really possessed the land until they came in under Joshua centuries, many centuries later. You might think of it this way. And then the Jewish people were spread all over the globe in the diaspora for centuries. And then in May of 1948, uh, the state of Israel was formed and now many have returned God's doing something in all of this. God's, he's fulfilling his promise. And these are all steps in it. This is what he's saying to Abram. First of all, I like what Abram does here. God says in verse 7, remember I told you I'm going to give you land. And I like the fact that in verse 8, uh, he says, how am I going to know that for sure? What assurance are you going to give me? You know what I see in that? I, I, I see there in Abram an aspiration. By that I mean I see a, a desire. I see a deep desire. I see a, a hunger on his part for God to fulfill what he promised him. He needed this encouragement regarding the land. And so here's what God said. God said, I'm going to cut a covenant with you. And in the ancient Near East in, in Abram's day, uh, covenants were cut. And by that, I mean this. The animals that are mentioned in that uh, ninth verse and in the tenth verse, these animals, the three of them, they were cut in half lengthwise from head to tail. And one half was laid on one side of a groove or ditch. And the other half was laid opposite on the other side. And then each of the two parties or people making the covenant were then to walk down the middle between these pieces of sliced animals in the blood that had drained in the ditch there. They were to, at bare feet, walk through that ditch. And as they did so, they would say something like this, let me be cut, let me be mutilated like these animals if I don't fulfill my end of the bargain, so to speak. So that's exactly what Abram does. He sets that up, and it says in verse 12, uh, here's what happened. At sundown, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a horror of great darkness enveloped him. And God said to Abram, I'm going to give you some uh, prophecy here, know of a surety that the seed that I'm going to give you will be a foreigner in a land that isn't theirs, and they'll be slaves, they'll serve them there, and they'll be afflicted for 400 years. Now we know that he's talking about 
the Israelites going down to Egypt, being uh, forced into slavery. The 400 years is just a rounded off number. It was actually 430 years when it was all said and done, but just rounded it off. And then he says, uh, verse 14, that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they'll come out with great substance, but you'll go to your father in peace and be buried in the good old age. But in the fourth generation, they'll, shall, they'll come hither, they'll come back to this land of Canaan that I promised, because the iniquity of the Canaanites isn't yet full. I'm not ready to punish them. I'm giving them, 400, I'm giving them all these centuries to repent. And uh, that's, that's God speaking to Abram here. And uh, so while Abram is waiting for God to show up in, after he has cut these animals, verse 11 says, When the fowls or the vultures came upon the car carcasses, Abram drove them away. So he's watching. He, he's, he's, sac he's killed these animals. He's laid them out as uh, was uh, done. He's watching and waiting. He's chasing the vultures away that would want to rob these animals. And then at sundown, he goes to sleep. Now, I just said that both individuals entering a covenant would have to walk through the blood and say the same thing. Let me be cut to pieces like this if I fail to live up to the, to, uh, the terms of this covenant. But what happens is Abram doesn't walk through the pieces. He goes to sleep instead. And he has a dream. And God speaks to him in that dream, in that vision. And then it says in verse 17, And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp or torch passed between the pieces. And in that same day the Lord made or cut a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thee have I given this land and he gives the, the uh, geographical dimensions of it as well. This is incredible because it takes two to make a covenant, but instead God put Abram to sleep and God says, I am going to take what is normally a bilateral covenant and I'm going to make it a unilateral covenant. And it is not going to be conditioned on your ability to live up to your terms. I am going to make this a unilateral, unconditional covenant. And if you mess up and you don't live up to it, then I will be cut in pieces instead of you. That's basically what happened. Because the only one that passed through those pieces was God himself in that smoking furnace and that burning lamp, a manifestation of the presence of the holiness of God. This is an incredible thing that God does here. In other words, what God promised Abram, a seed and a land and a blessing, is going to happen regardless of how bad Abraham acts. Regardless of how bad Abram messes up or his people. That covenant of Abraham has not yet fully been uh, uh, fulfilled, but it will one day because it rests upon the very person and pledge an oath of God himself. And the writer of Hebrews in chapter 6 says that so clearly that he swore by one, by, by someone no greater than himself. He swore by himself because no one greater that he could swear by. It's referring to this very incident here. I'm telling you, you mess with God's people you mess with God's plan. And when you mess with God's plan, there are always consequences that come from that. That's why we better be very careful. We better be very careful. We don't approve of everything that the state of Israel stands for, the state of Israel does. Don't misunderstand that. But God has a plan in place, and nothing can revoke that. Because the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance, according to Romans chapter 11 and verse 29. And it relates specifically to what God has covenanted with Abram and with the Jewish people about. God has a plan for this nation. He gives the geographical dimensions of it in verses 13 to 17 uh, and uh, uh, rather 18 to 21. 
I'm not going to go into it. I would just simply say this. Probably the closest that Israel has ever gotten to fulfilling the dimensions, the geographical dimensions of the land that God promised to them was under the reign of King Solomon. But it never has been fulfilled yet, and it won't be until Messiah Jesus comes and he sets up his kingdom and rules in Jerusalem. But let's pause a moment because I would say this. There's nothing that we can uh, say about Abram and the promises of God and the covenant that God made with him that does not also apply to all the nations of this earth. It applies to Israel, but it also applies to us because through Abram and through Israel, through the seed and through the Messiah that comes through Israel, God is going to, to deal with and, and move and bless all the nations of this earth. That includes us. As I said, I think Genesis 15, 6 is, uh, is expounded on in Romans chapter 4 especially, but the first half of chapter 5 too. But the application that I want to make to us right now is simply this. In the scriptures, the land that God promises to Israel is symbolic is symbolic of the victorious Christian life that God promises to you and I who are believers. And based upon that, then this land inheritance probably could spiritually be applied in Romans 6, 7, and 8. And I think that like Abram had a heart hunger for the fulfillment of the promise that God made to him. If you or I will ever enjoy a holy life, a victorious Christian life, it will only begin when you, like Abram, have a heart hunger for what God says he promises to you and will provide to you that life more abundantly. If you don't have a hunger for that, you'll never experience it. You'll live a humdrum uh, below the, the, the line of normal Christian life. You'll be subnormal. You'll never really enjoy the Christian life. It'll all be just uh, so much uh, knowledge, head knowledge, and it won't be heart experiential knowledge. But that's what God wants. And it begins with a heart hunger. And I want to challenge you as we close th this morning. I hope that your heart hungers for the spiritual provision, for that, uh, that, uh, that spiritual land of Canaan that God promises to the people of God. That abundance that is ours in Christ. I hope you at least have a hunger for that. It's all based on a blood covenant that, uh, uh, that Jesus made for us on Calvary. By the way, Abram messed up and so did his seed, and that's why the Messiah had to be crucified. He was mutilated. And he was mutilated for you and I as well because the blessing of the nations are included in that uh, seed of Abraham the Messiah. He was mutilated for your sake. And that blood sacrifice that he uh, made for us on Calvary, we're told in, Revelation, uh, in Romans chapter 6 that when he died for our sins, he also died unto sin, and that we died with him. We were crucified with him. And we realize then that in the death of Christ, we were slaves. We were enslaved to sin and to self that is within us, so that we come to a place, I hope, in our life where we cry out with Paul, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And that we then proceed into the 8th chapter of Romans where the answer is so clearly given that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the, spirit of the, of, of, uh, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And there is victory over that enslavement to sin because we died, we were crucified to sin with Jesus and because the spirit of God in us sets us free from the domination as we depend upon him 
for that victorious holy life. There's no need to be afraid. The victory is, is yours if you're a believer. A few years ago, uh, my wife and I had a, uh, the joy of uh, having some friends of ours visit us from Connecticut. At that time, uh, he owned an airplane, a private uh, single-engine airplane. And he and his wife flew down to an airport not too far from here. And we drove over there and we met them. And we had a delightful day. He, we got in the airplane with him and his wife and uh, he flew us from uh, here over to Block Island. And uh, when we got to Block Island, we got out of the plane and we went into the uh, diner there, or the restaurant at the airport. He paid for our, our lunch. And then he said, have you ever been on Block Island? No. Well, let me show you around. He hired a cab and, and uh, he took us to significant places on Block Island and then back in the plane and, and then back uh, uh, home here. It was a delightful day. And I thought about that, and I'm thinking, you know, I could have never have done that, obviously, unless I had gotten in that plane. And when I got in that plane, everything was taken care of. Not only was I transported, but uh, at all, everything was paid for. I didn't have any expense at all. It was a delightful, a delightful flight and a wonderful day. I'm thinking... You know what the victorious Christian life is? You know what living in this promise, this spiritual promised land of Canaan is for the believer? It's like getting into a plane. It's like depending upon Jesus and he lifts you and enables you to fly, so to speak. We can't fly. The law of gravity keeps us down. But when you get in an airplane, you're able to overcome the law of gravity and you're able to soar. You're able to, to, uh, to fly. That's exactly what life in Christ is. It's in Christ, if we depend upon Him, He defeats that gravity of sin that would drag us down into evil. And He lifts us up and lets us soar in the Spirit of God so that we can live victoriously above sin. And you know what? I, I hate to admit this, but I have to be honest. I know more about that up here intellectually than I live out on a daily basis in my life, and that's what, uh, that's what smites my heart. And if you've never experienced that, you need to get in the plane, and you need to, you need to experience the flight of a holy, victorious Christian life there is no joy, there is no thrill greater than that than knowing that you are dependent upon the Lord and He is carrying you through and He is pleased because it's His victory in your life. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you might just use these things that we have talked about in dealing with fear and then the difficulty of waiting for the fulfillment of your promises. Lord, you are a God who cannot lie. And what you have said you will do, regardless of the time lapse, you are faithful, you'll do it. May we never doubt you. And when we have those doubts or those fears, may we go back and be reaffirmed through the word of God and shown through reassurance of the scripture what you've said. May we believe it. May anyone here today that, has, or that, that uh, is listening who has never believed in the Lord for salvation, may they do so. And may those of us who have realize that the same way that you believe in the Lord and are saved is the same faith that you believe in the Lord and you are sanctified and you are uh, made holy and you have victory in your life. May we live by faith. We pray like Abram in Jesus' name. Amen.